Uh, morning, everyone. What is it? Afternoon? Oh, it's afternoon. Sorry I'm a little bit late, but I flew on Singapore Airlines and they were delayed. <laughs> and AirAsia had no more seats for us, so I had to take the airline that I don't really like very much. Um, I got my own cap today, since you're all wearing caps, so I'll put on mine. And I'll go in and do this speech. Uh, Dean Ilian Mihoff. And uh, Uruz Pia, Dean of Degree Programs. By the way, I thought I was a good marketing man, but you're fairly aggressive. <laughs> you just didn't stop talking about how great INSEAD is, that even I want to come here now. Anyway, I'm thrilled to be here, and firstly, can I offer my congratulations to everyone who's graduated. Um, it must be a fantastic feeling, and I'm particularly proud today because one of our staff is here who is an exceptional young leader and a future entrepreneur, hopefully with us, uh, Michael Teo. Where are you, Michael? <laughs> He's going to help me revolutionize and disrupt the cargo industry over the next few years. We're very proud of you, all 20,000 all-stars from AirAsia. You've done a fantastic job, and don't expect a pay rise. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I'll try and be serious like the dean, except for his box of chocolates. Uh, as I said, I'm thrilled to be here. In, in, I was given the kind of average age of many of you, and so it kind of reminds me from when I started at AirAsia. But I'll just go back a little bit in time in that I uh, graduated from London School of e Economics, and I didn't know what to do, so I went and became an accountant, which was the worst period of my life. And I passed every exam because I hated it so much. And then I became an auditor for six months which really was hell on earth, uh, even worse than dealing with politicians. And um, I was a musician, so I wrote to every record company, and uh, they all rejected me except one, which was uh, Virgin. And I want to give you a little story, because the dean mentioned about luck a little bit, but you sometimes make your own luck as well, and you've got to grab chances. And that's the, probably the best advice I'm going to give you today is grabbing chances. So I went to every record company and they all told me to go to hell, except one, which was Virgin, who gave me an interview. And I went to Virgin, did the interview, and they also told me to go to hell. And so I was walking out, fairly dejected, and Richard Branson was walking in. And I thought, right, shall I be a shy Malaysian and just smile and never see him again? and regret it for the rest of my life, or shall I do something to encourage him to talk to me and I get a second chance? I, I can't remember what I said, something about the wild jungles of Borneo or something. And um, he got interested, started talking to me at the door, and he said, hey, you're kind of an interesting guy, let's go and have a cup of coffee, which we did. And then he said, uh, why are you here? I said, oh, I, got, I came for a job interview and you guys rejected me. And he said, look, there's something really special about you. I'm going to give you a job. And that gave me my big break. And life is like that, you know, that if you don't take chances, if you analyze too much, if you use too many of the theories that they taught you at INSEAD, um, you'll never make a decision. <laughs> And life is about making decisions and taking risk and taking chance, which your dean mentioned. And my whole life has been like that. And I'm going to give you two or three examples of that. So after Virgin, Richard, who became a good friend and remains a very good dear friend of mine, said to me, I'm going to start an airline. And I said, are you mad? And he said, no, nope, I'm sick of British Airways. I'm going to start an airline. At that point, I decided that I wasn't going to be part of Virgin because I knew he didn't have enough money and he'd have to sell uh, Virgin Records. So I left and joined Warner Music. And my prophecy was right. He sold Virgin Records to EMI, 
but where my prophecy was wrong was that EMI uh, virgin people took over EMI. And then um, <clears throat> I worked at Warner and I was relegated to the basement. Uh, I was a financial controller and they treated accountants really bad there. And I was doing these inane reports. You know, it, it was like I knew no one would read these reports. So I went to my boss and I said, hey, can I change the report? And he said, no, this time we've done it for 10 years, you've got to keep doing it. Now, I've always been someone that if I take someone's salary, or if I take, I'm always going to want to do something that makes a difference, which is what your dean said, when you go out and change the world, make sure you remember INSEAD in all your TV interviews, but also change the world. And so I went and bought my own software. Now, you're all too young, but those days, uh, Harvard Graphics was the uh, most powerful presentation tool. And I went and bought it, and I redid the report and sent it up to my chairman. And I told my girlfriend at the time, I'm going to be fired tomorrow, but I can't do a piece of work that I know no one's going to read. I can't conform. You know, I've got to do something that I think is valuable. And the next day I came in, and all my colleagues were around a computer looking at something. And I went over there, and it was my piece of work. And I thought, right, I'm definitely going to be fired. And they said, the chairman wants to see you. He says, the best piece of work he's ever seen. And so I was shuttered up to the seventh floor, the gods of the music industry. And there were legends, Ahmet Ertegen. These are people who created Atlantic Records and Electra Records. And we started talking. He said, hey, you really have a passion for music. Why don't you go back and be general manager of Warner Music Malaysia? And maybe in five, six years' time, we will make you CEO. I didn't ask the salary. I didn't ask what my benefits were. That was an opportunity, and I grabbed it. I didn't ask my grandmother, grandfather, friends, which all of us Asians generally do before we make a decision, then check with the dean. Um, <laughs> I just did it. Sorry, you're right next to me. So <laughs> they all want to say the things I've been saying to you for two years. <laughs> So um, I grabbed it, and I came to Malaysia, I was 27 years old, and I changed loads of things. I, I brought in local music and Chinese music, and uh, we grew very, very fast. In six months, they made me CEO of Warner Music Malaysia. And I had a fantastic, so I was 27, 28, and I was CEO of a record company, which was amazing. And then I grew within Warner, and we had so many mergers. Started with Warner Communications, it became Time Warner, CNN came along, and then AOL. And that was one merger too many for me. And so I was in Rockefeller Plaza, and AOL and Time Warner, Warner came up with the term IBITA, earnings before everything you don't like. <laughs> you know, and then call it cash flow. Well, what about the eight billion in the balance sheet? And I was sitting here listening to Steve Case and Bob Pittman, who were the owners of AOL in 75 Rockefeller Plaza. They were talking about their vision and I was thinking, what drugs are these guys on? You know, this is 2001, the dot-com boom. And uh, I made my career in one statement. So Steve Case says to me, Tony, what do you reckon our stock price should be in a year's time? It was $80 at that time. And I thought, mm, listening to you, if it's still $80, we're doing well. But I knew I couldn't say that. I said, $90. And he went, wrong boy, $500. That's when my famous mouth opened, and I said, please give me some of the drugs you are taking. <laughs> and I knew at that point my career was over, and uh, I went to my boss, and I said, look, I quit. I don't share the vision here. I don't want to be a hypocrite and take your salary. I, you know, I quit. He was thrilled because he always wanted to get rid of me because he thought I was after his job, which I was. And so he paid me money and I left. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I flew from London, uh, from New York to London, because London was kind of my second home uh, in many ways because I grew up there. And I went to a bar, a pub. You do those things, having a Ribena. And uh, contemplated the rest of my life. And I saw Stelios of EasyJet on television a fellow alumni of the London School of Economics. And um, I don't think there's an INSEAD owner 
of a low-cost airline. So maybe if you give me an honorary degree, I can promote INSEAD as well. <laughs> um, change your color a bit to red. <laughs> so, so um, oh, they're discussing about it. Maybe I have a chance. <laughs> so, uh, where was I? Oh, yes, sitting in the pub. And um, I saw Stelios talking about low-cost airlines. And I always, I always kind of loved planes. It was I sent to boarding school when I was 12. You know, I'd never been to England before in my life. And my parents said to me, hey, you're going to boarding school. I thought, interesting concept. And uh, got to London. And I thought, wow, there's so many white people here. I've never seen so many white people. Now, if you arrive in London, it's not a problem. Everyone's Indian. Um, so you feel quite at home at Heathrow Airport. So, <laughs> slight digression. So I thought, this looks interesting. I went to Luton Airport, and I saw people flying to Barcelona for eight pounds, people flying to Spain for, you know, Madrid for six pounds, and Paris for five pounds. I thought, wow, what a great concept. Everything was orange, and, you know, people were generally happy. And so there's a very fine line between brilliance and stupidity. It's very, very narrow. But I thought at that point, I'm 35, you know, I'm gonna give it a go. If I fail, I fail. Who cares? I'll come and be an INSEAD lecturer. Um, <laughs> uh, that's it, I've just cost my doctorate now. <laughs> but if I win, who knows? which is the second piece of advice. Life is short. And you don't want to sit there at 55 and say, I wish I did it. Because it's too late. You can't press a rewind button. So you guys are going out into this fantastically exciting world. And life is great. Don't let anyone tell you it's not great. Don't moan about it. Don't be negative about it. Be positive. Because life's much more fun when you're positive. And take risks. If you fail, you fail but at least you tried. Because if you don't try, you'll never know. And dream, because it's okay to dream. No one, ever, no one ever got told off for dreaming. And from some of those dreams come reality. And you're living at a live example of a dream, right? I saw an idea in a pub, I came back, six months later, we bought an airline for 25 cents. 16 years later, We've gone from two planes to 220 planes, from 200,000 passengers to this year we'll carry 73 million passengers, from Malaysia never winning an award in the airline business to us winning best low-cost airline in the world nine times in a row, from 200 staff to 20,000 staff. Dreams do come true from risks. So remember this little story and go there, and make a difference. And it doesn't matter if you fail. Be positive, enjoy yourselves, and live life to the most. Live life like it's your last day that you're gonna be on Earth. That's my philosophy. Because if I'm hit by a bus, and there are many people in Singapore who'd like to drive that bus, I would have lived a great life and had no regrets. And I've had some pretty spectacular failures. Right, I owned a Formula One team, which lost me a lot of money, and I was pretty far back in the grid. But I was sitting, standing on the same grid as Ferrari and McLaren and Williams. I did it. I wasn't successful, but I did it. I own a football club, which isn't as bad as Caterham yet, <laughs> but we're rebuilding, and we haven't given up. But I did it. For a guy who used to listen to shortwave radio, um, on listening to BBC World Service for football, to sitting at the Etihad Stadium, the last game of the season, deciding uh, who was going to win, cha be champions. If Man City won, they became champions. If Man City lost, Manchester United would have become champions. So dreams come, do come true. From, mu from accounting, to music, to airlines. So live your life to the most and be real positive. I also want to congratulate INSEAD. I love the fact that you talk about diversity so much. I think that is so critical. And when I look around all of you in green, 
it's fantastic to see so many different colors and ages and different beards and some with no hair who love the uh, tournament and some with lots of hair. It's fantastic. I love diversity. And at AirAsia, when we started, there were no female pilots. I was like, why are there no female pilots? And they came up with the most ridiculous answer that can never be repeated in public again. And I said, if a woman can run a country, she can certainly fly a plane. And today, we have 120 female pilots. And the other day was history. Captain was female. Co-pilot was female. All the cabin crew were female. Um, chief engineer was female. And all the passengers were male. Um, <laughs> That last bit's not quite true. But we're very proud. I promoted Irene, our, who started in the finance department, to now deputy CEO, and she has a fantastic opportunity to succeed me. So at AirAsia, we don't care what creed, color, race, religion, age, sex you are. We want the best. And we want people, my job is to turn raw diamonds into diamonds. I've taken boys who never had the chance to go to INSEAD or a great education because of economic reasons and girls, but they had a huge brain. And we've taken guys who carried bags for us, who are now pilots. We've taken call center uh, staff who are now CEOs, and we give everyone a chance to use their brains for the most. So in summary, I have three minutes and 17 seconds, and like AirAsia, I will be on time, um, unlike Singapore Airlines. Uh, we. We, um, I want to give you the last piece of advice. As you go out there and become super successful and always mention INSEAD in all your TV interviews and press interviews, make sure you remain humble. Make sure you remain what you were when you first started. Ego is the biggest killer of any great CEO. Being accessible to your staff, being accessible to your partners, is critical. Don't sit in your big ivory tower with your door closed. Make sure you're accessible because you're only as good as the people under you. AirAsia is an amazing company with 20,000 amazing brains. It's not like many companies, only the top 10 decide everything. I'd rather have 20,000 brains working for me than just 10. And you know that's why I fly all the way to come and say well done to Michael, who I'm extremely proud of because he's an amazing guy who's done amazing things for us. So, dare to dream, believe the unbelievable, never take no for a future. Congratulations, class of 17. You should be very proud. Go out there and make a difference. Take some risks, enjoy life, and be positive. Thank you very much.